Hello everybody, it's the Alco Diesel Guy with another project for you. This is a B40-8 in CSX paint, and I believe I said that right. Hopefully I'm not remaking that mistake I made with that wide cab BNSF GE locomotive, which is another type dash 8, but with the wide cab. This is the type without the wide cab. I've had this engine, I want to say, since either 2011 or 2010, when I got back into the N-scale side of the hobby. After being out of it for a while, I want to say back by those days, it was about 20 years, 20, almost 30 years I was out of the hobby. Uh, the, of the N-Scale part of it, I want to say. I got my first N-Scale set way back when I was like 8 years old. Old, love that thing to death, the Bachman set. Anywho, long story short, I got this thing in 2011, 2012 when I got back into the N-Scale side of it. Because, there were, because of how things worked out that year, there was enough room to put an HO scale layout up, so I put an N-Scale layout up. And I really got back into it. I was impressed with how these things have DCC and everything else. Got out of the, that part of the hobby for a couple of years, and in more recent times, as you know, for the years I've been making videos on N-Scale, got back into it about two or three years ago now, at the start of the pandemic. Just because I kind of figured, hey, wouldn't it be cool to get these things running again and put a layout up because I had more time on my hands, unfortunately, as many of us did during that period with um, work and everything else during the pandemic and the lockdowns. Anywho, uh, this engine has been sitting in storage since the 2010s, the early 2010s. I want to say since 20. 13 or 14. I tried to run this the other day. I pulled it off the shelf and it didn't do anything. But I think I, in fact, actually, I tried to run it today earlier and it didn't do anything, if I remember correctly. I have a few of these older engines which I'm going to be going through here to see if they're workable or what's going on with them. And I'm going to now go through it and try to see if I can get it running. So last time I checked this thing out, it wouldn't move at all. I know it has DCC on it because it doesn't buzz, or at least it didn't when I put it on my layout. Right now I have my DCC track live. This is again with my MRC. Project, Prodigy Express, which I mind, might add, as I've mentioned, is already starting to show reliability problems despite its age. I tried to reprogram this thing, so I'm going to give it a shot one more time with that. Why not? Um, am I zoomed out far enough for you guys? Probably not. Did accidentally pause you there. Sorry about that. Went and zoomed out here. Let's go ahead and see now if this thing will do anything. Um, it's 5933. Enter. And I'm throttling up and down, and nothing is happening, just like last time. So I know it'll respond to programming commands, because I've tried. Let me go ahead and try again to see what happens here. I'm going to unplug this, plug in my programming track. I find it's easier just to swap between the two of them in retrospect. It's just too much of a pain to keep the two tracks separate. Let's go now and try to program using the program track here. <clears throat> Let's give this thing a different address. Let's try again 5933, just to prove it does react. Go ahead and hit enter. Doesn't look like it responded there. It was responding earlier today, so I don't know what's going on here. <clears throat> okay, let's try that again. Program again. Probe track. Thirty-three. Enter. Nothing. Now, do I have the right plug hooked in here? That's always a good question. Yes, I do. So it is not responding to programming commands. Before it was jerking around when I did that, which is a good thing, which means that if it jerks back and forth a little bit, it means the decoder is responding to your commands and it's actually programming itself. But unfortunately here, it's not doing anything, which is not a good sign. Let me go, go back to my pro power track and try one more time here. See if it'll do anything. I'm on 5933, I'm throttling up and throttling down, nothing happens. Okay, so very clearly, without a doubt, this thing is dead as a dodo. Why, I don't know, but I'm going to find out, because I'm not about to let this thing sit around. Hopefully it's a contact problem and not a decoder, because that would mean more of an investment that I'd like to make in it. But to be honest, I probably will, because I'm getting back into these GEs, and admittedly, gives me something to do on this boring night. Well, from work and, you know... Not exactly hot outside, not exactly cool. Anywho, without further ado, let's get this thing apart and see what's going on here. Carefully wiggle it to get it off. There we are. So underneath the hood, we have, in fact, a DCC decoder. That is one I definitely installed. I can tell because of the fact that these fins aren't in correctly. This is a TCS AM4, I bet you. AMD4, yeah, and if you look at this, you see the decoder is loose. I wouldn't be surprised. Oh, look at that. The lights are blinking. I don't know if you saw that. The little light just flashed a little bit. 
If not, I think I just figured out what the problem is. It turns out I don't have solder on here to make the contact. But yet, that appears to be what's going on here. Yep, so the decoder is loose in there. This is an AMD4, and the AMD4s from TCS are a pretty good, high, I should say, really high-quality decoder, but they have one flaw. They're a little bit too on the thin side for these stock board slot things, so they tend to be loose in here as this one is. It's moving around, and that's no good. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to break out my soldering iron and uh, put some solder in all four of these ports here. So without further ado, I shall get that set up. Let me cut the power for my DCC system, rather unplug it. Let me get my iron set up, which is right over here. Uh, okay. I'm going to be using my little USB iron. I picked this up just before or just after Christmas. I forgot exactly when. I think it was just after Christmas. I got a good deal on it. Really easy to work with on these tiny models. While I let that thing heat up, I'm going to go ahead now and disassemble the locomotive because I have to get the frame apart to get this decoder out. So let's go and take care of that. As with anything, I remove the lights around. I'm going to take this shell and put it someplace safe because I don't want to accidentally burn it or anything. I'm going to now take this, place it on its side. And I'm going to now loosen these two screws to get the actual locomotive apart. <clears throat> Another one of my unusual screwdrivers for my collection. <clears throat> this one I think I got with a computer monitor that was actually including it with it for free, which is strange. One of the cheaper monitors I had, in fact. Let's pull this um, batter, the fuel tank off the bottom so I can split the frame. Because I'm going to have to pull this thing completely out and put it back in again. I'm also going to carefully do a few other changes. Now, I know this thing is probably going to split and go nuts when I do this. Oh, I'm going to kill my... I'm going to kill this thing, aren't I? Let's loosen this a little bit further. Open wide. <laughs> ah, there it goes. Oof. I hate pulling these things apart because the parts usually go everywhere. In that case, that actually came out pretty smooth, although the motor did kind of jerk free. Push this back into place. The motor itself feels pretty free. I don't think I have to do any lubrication here. Oh, 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 I just touched some... I'll take that back. I just touched some really disgusting stuff here. Yeah, I might have to go more hardcore on this one. So we got... Let's see here, this worm gear here, which is stuck in there good. Oh yeah, this has got gungy gr grease on it. This is disgusting stuff. I'm probably going to put a vat of alcohol together for this here, rubbing alcohol, and just let it bathe in that. As I say, because these things, oh my god. This is that infamous grease that Atlas has used for years, and a lot of other manufacturers use for years, and it's just disgusting. It, it cakes, it crusts, and it makes running these engines difficult. It puts a lot of stress on the motor. Uh, when this happens, essentially what you have to do is rebuild the engine. You can't run it anymore like this. It looks like someone was here before me, maybe myself, because I'm seeing one. Of, I think I see two thrust washers on this, but I don't think so. Hmm. Let me just make sure I don't lose that thrust washer, because I'll, ne I'll never get this back if I lose this. Thrust washer, just so you know, is this little plastic um, protector thingy that you that we that we put right behind the brass flywheel to prevent it from making contact from uh, with the actual plastic guide bearing thing so it doesn't burn so it doesn't shred it okay inside the frame we have a little grease i'm gonna get a wipe in a second clean that up let me go get a plastic dish and uh, fill it with um alcohol and i'll be right back so it looks like i'm gonna have to get a little bit more intense with this thing okay so now i have myself a little plastic soup dish thing from a takeout restaurants I'm not sure if this is from a pizza restaurant or a Chinese restaurant. I have a whole bunch of these things. I'm going to go ahead now and take my gears, which are full of this grease, and just let them soak in there. I'm going to let them sit possibly overnight, maybe for a few hours. i got to see how I feel about that. The grease is pretty thick, and I prefer to dissolve as much of it as possible. I'm going to actually get a paper towel and borrow some of this and go over the internals of that. Okay, I'm going to go now and I dip my little a little piece of paper towel in that, a vat I had here, and I'm just going to go and clean out the grease from these little crevices in here. Yuck. Ugh. Yuck. There's just no other way of describing it. 
I know it's childish, but... Yeah, this stuff is bad. It's butterscotch slash glue mixed with cement. And I think the crazy thing is this is supposed to be lubricant. And it's not doing any of that right now, period. Get a little bit more out of here. I'm going to be very generous with this because I wanted to eat as much of this off as I possibly can. Oh, this one's really bad on this side. Oh, wow, look at this. Looks like I tried to lubricate this back in the day. I was over over lubricating my stuff, and there you have some of that. Luckily, it doesn't look like it was here too long. And as a result, it hasn't dried up. Damn. Ugh. Back to screw in there. That's not good. Yeah. Probably is actually probably a safer place for it, thinking about it in retrospect, but yeah, I'll just put it in there and Yeah, no, I knocked the now I knocked the washer off. Ugh. Yeah, you can tell I'm tired, right? Ugh. Ugh. Ay 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 ay. To the back. Now let's take a look at these trucks, which I have a feeling are gonna be bad if not worse. As bad if not worse, and oh yeah, look at that. There's grease on them. It's the it's the stuff I usually use. Uh, do I want to take these apart, or do I want to try to just do a surface, or do I want to just maybe throw them in there and let them degrease that way? You know, I wonder if that would work. I'm almost tempted to try that. The, the grease on here doesn't seem too bad actually compared to everything else. This did not get much mileage, I can tell immediately. It's most likely because it never ran. Um, let me just get some of this grease off here, not much of it, just a little of it off. I think this will be okay. It runs smooth. Do I want to take a chance? I think this will actually be fine. I don't feel it really dragging too much at all. In fact, it seems like it's in really good shape. I'm just going to clean a little of the grease off here. And I think I'll call this one good. I should save my opinion for this other one here. This is the other truck. This has even less on it. Yeah, I think I can get away with just... Yeah, look at how much grease is on here, though. Eh, maybe I should take these apart if I can remember how to do this. Ugh, this just became a very massive restoration project. I'm going to get these apart. Or maybe, thinking about it, why do I have to take this apart? I don't need to... I could probably just put it in. Oh, really, this does run smooth, thinking about it. So, yeah, maybe I'll just be happy and not touch them, because it seems like they're not too bad. There's a little grease on them, but not too much, and I've taken some of it off. It's got synthetic lube on it, so this will... I think this will be fine, yep. I think I'm just going to leave them like they are. Okay, it's all. That's what I'm going to do. Okay, so I'm gonna let these pieces um, soak here a while, and I'll get back on this. And I'll get back to them in a second. Let me put the top on this. I always keep the lid for these these things, so I can always put it, put the lid back on. That comes in very handy, so you don't have to worry about the parts, um, the the alcohol spilling all over the place. So now that I have a plan together for this. I'm gonna move these parts to the side so I don't lose them, burn them, etc. And I'm gonna start getting ready to reassemble this. But first, I have to fix the decoder up. What I need to do now is, after I turn my extractor on, is I need to get, I need to put on this decoder here. I'll zoom you in a little bit further so you can see better what's going on here. Let's go in three times because that's what the preset is in here. I need to now put solder on all four of these pads here. That's what's going to basically hold the decoder in place better. Um, let me go ahead and fire up my iron. Um, I'm trying to debate whether I want to use flux on this. I think I can get away without doing flux. I'm told you should not use flux. TCS does not want you using flux with these. So I'm going to just going to put a little bit in there and see how it works. And if I have to, I have to. Let me go ahead and make this iron work correctly. I'm going to actually hit the plus. I forgot to make it fire up. Let me activate my extractor fan. It's going to make some noise, so cover your ears. Um, let's move this thing out of the way my track. I don't need this thing here. 
I really don't want it there either because I would prefer not to melt any plastic on it. That'd be not, that would not be nice. That would not be nice. No, no, I don't think so at all. Now, where's my solder? I had, oh, here it is. It's in my drawer right next to me. I actually started organizing myself. I now have the parts right, in, right arm's length off to the side here in a drawer. I'm gonna now tin my iron once this thing wakes up and gets hot enough. Again, this is a small handheld iron. Let's now tin this up. See my extractor fan working pretty well right there. I'm just going to now apply this to all of these sections. I turn this around. I want it on the top there, not the bottom. Let me actually move all the plastic stuff away. That would be really smart. Yeah, that really would be smart if I did that, wouldn't it? Okay, and I'm just going to gently apply just a little bit of solder right there. If I can get it to stick, that'd be really cool. No, I want it to stay hot. I mean, I don't want it cool, but... Yeah, I think I'm going to have to use flux on this. I hate doing that, but... Especially since I've been told not to in more recent times. Let me get this thing out of the way over here. It's going to keep falling on me. Let's go and grab a little flux. <sighs> hate doing this, but I guess I have no choice. And TCS does not recommend you do this, but I cannot find my clean flux right now. I'm just going to put a little bit on it to guide the to guide the solder in place and make it stick a little bit better. Okay, with the flux in place, now I'm going to try that again. I should have better results now. Again, TCS constantly says not to do it. This decoder is well beyond its warranty anyway, so there's no way it's going to it covered it's at least 10 years old there is no way they would cover the warranty and I don't think I have a receipt for it anyway so there's no way that's gonna happen so let's go and get some little bit on there as you can see the difference immediately it sticks right to where I want it put another one on and we're gonna turn it around again my usual disclaimer applies here this is quite dangerous so know what you're doing before you do it let's gently run it across here I'm gonna do more of it right here Very careful not to heat this up too much. There we go. And that's just like that, it jumps right onto it. Okay, and just like that, we made the solder repair, and that should be good. Let me fire up, let me turn my soldering iron off. I'll leave the iron on, I'll leave the fan on for a little bit. Unplug it, there it goes, power's off. Leave my extractor fan on for a little bit here to make sure all the fumes are out. Didn't make much, this is lead-free solder, but I'm just very careful with it a lot of times. So I have forgotten to turn it on once or twice. Okay, I just switched the fan off. Now, it's time to work on getting these parts cleaned up a bit. Let me zoom you out a bit. I can do it without accidentally stopping the film, which would be really great. There we go. I've got my dish with the parts in it. Ugh. Okay. Okay, now, I'm going to have to take this and actually run it inside my toothbrush, if I remember correctly how to do this, and just let the bristles take the stuff out. I'll probably let those parts sit in there a little bit like that. That's really all there is to it. So you can see most of it got dissolved just from sitting in the in the alcohol. The stuff really does a great job as rubbing alcohol stuff.
Oh, I hate those little parts. They drive me up the wall. Anyway, that's going to do it for those right now. Let me let those dry off a bit, and I'll get ready to reassemble this thing. Okay, it should have dried off. And in the process I found for my parts, spin another one of these washers for this thing. Just to make sure it fits in here. It should. Should. Emphasis on should. I don't know for sure because it is from a different model. But luckily, I think it will. Come on, you can do it. Yeah, it worked. A little bit bigger, but it'll fit in that space. That'll work well enough. Okay, so now I got that in place. I can start now with the part that was missing ready back in place. I can start now reassembling everything. Let us start by taking these gears, which should be nice and dry now, and they are, and putting them back into place. Again, I'm not going to lubricate them with anything more but grease. I'm not going to bother with the oil on the worm gears like I usually do. I usually lubricate these axles here. I decided not to bother with in this case. See what it, see what difference that makes. So I'll just spin this. I'll actually, take you in a little bit closer so you can see what I'm doing here. There we go. So now what I'm going to do here is I'm going to rotate the shaft over until the motor lines up and takes the key here. And then once that's the case, this will then fall into these locating brackets. I'm starting again with the, I should mention, I'm starting again with the, with the frame on this side with these two bracket locating thingies that hold the bearings in place. They slip right in here. And I'm just going to make sure now it's hooked up. As you see, as I turn, that thing spins. Slowly I toy. <laughs> Props to anyone who can figure out that early 1950s TV reference that has been used several times over and over again. I technically don't need grease on this, but yeah, just a teeny weeny bit like that should be fine. And I'm just going to let it sit on top of that and just get pushed around. That's all you need. Now I'm going to take the second gear that I took care of and cleaned up pretty well and put it on on this side. Same procedure. Line up with the shaft, spin the shaft until it takes it. There's a key that this has to go in for. It's like a shape. There's an oblong shape there. Once that's aligned, I then line these two bearings up and they slip right into, the, right into these two cut out things. Rotate the motor over and make sure again that the gear is turning as we see it is. Now I'm going to take just a drop of this micro gear grease from the bell. It's 106 micro gear grease. Just a teeny drop on there like that. That's all you need. I push it down a little bit. That's all we're putting on there. And we're done. With that, this should be good to go in terms of lubrication. Now, before I put the other half of the shell on, I'm going to install my decoder right away. Again, this is a this is an AM, AMD4, uh, I believe they call these, from TCS. These two contact plates go on the bottom. They line up here with your motor pickups, which are on top here. I'm going to go ahead now and feed them through. Again, according to the instructions from all these manufacturers, uh, TCS, I should say, says you should lubricate it. Uh, pardon me, says you should isolate this with Kapton tape. All that said, however, I don't, in the instructions they show on their website with assembling these, I do not see anyone actually using it with one or two exceptions. So it's kind of strange. They say you should use it, but yet I, I never see anyone using it. It's very weird. Uh, I understand why they want to do it, and I do use this when I put a sound decoder from MRC in because they don't have that, or if I'm using a decoder that does not have these two cutouts in it. I will put, I will insulate the frame up here, but in a case like this where I have this, these two cutouts and I can just run the motor connections right into them and fold them over the top, I'll just do that because I know they'll hold them in place rigidly enough and it won't be a problem. Let's see if I can make this cooperate now. Oh, eyes, eyes. <sighs> Still suffering from the dilation from the eye doctor appointment I had today. I see. Come on, come on, come on. I have to go in there with my with my tweezers. Get this board to go behind it. Ugh, it's killing my eyes. I can't tell where I am actually. Hold this back. There we go. Now I've forced it in.
Okay, change of plans. I hate doing this, but I'm going to have to tear this thing all apart and insulate it because I cannot get that to fit. Despite my best efforts. In fact, the camera ran out while I was attempting to get it in and get these darn motor contacts to fit into these things here on the decoder, these slots on the decoder. So what I'm going to do is just take it out again, pull the whole thing out, and insulate that one side because that's the one side I can't get in. There is, I got this. I got this part out. I'm going to now insulate this section here. Actually, I have a pre piece of pre-cut Kapton that should go right in there nicely. Wrapping it around that. So now this won't make contact with anything. If it does, it's going to hit the contact. It's going to hit the Kapton tape. Nothing else. And now I'm going to put the motor back in place. Ugh, I really hate using Kapton tape when I don't have to. Stuff isn't exactly expensive, but... Not easy to come by for me in my current location, and yeah. Also, I find it tends to lose its stick a lot of a lot around here. I know a lot of people said last time that that was because the frame was greased. It's not. The, the fact is, I have a very humid basement room where I do all this, and the humidity just plays havoc with anything resembling glue, and it'll destroy the stickiness. The tape is basically reduced to just plastic. It doesn't have any stick left, and there's nothing you can do about it once that happens. It's just useless. You get nothing you can do with it, I should say. It's just, yeah, complete useless plastic at that point because you can't get it to stick to anything and that's the whole point of tape uh, it's got to actually stick to go in place let's now actually put this worm gear back together here oh my camera's going out of focus again okay back in it goes take the gear over until it goes into position just like we did before there it is it's in okay so now I go ahead now and um, put the mo put the board back in place. We'll try to put it in place this time. It wouldn't cooperate before. Let's see if I can make it work this time. See, now that piece of Kapton will insulate this... Oh, darn thing, focus. It will now insulate that motor contact from making contact with the actual frame itself. And watch it now cooperate just because I did that. But hey, however it works, I don't care. <laughs> Okay, let's see. My autofocus is giving me a problem here. Focus, poke is way out of focus, but let's see if we can get this in here. This needs to get folded back over. Come on, stay down, stay down, stay down. It has to have force on this contact, so i got to be careful not to bend it too far down, but it has to go up there. It's just above the board. I do is I just need to slip this right underneath the board. Like so. Oh, wow, look at that. It actually went in. Huh. After all that, now that it, now it decides to cooperate and just slip into place. For goodness sakes. Oh, gee golly, anyway. Oh, golly. Let's shove this in there. Good. And I think that's pretty good in there. Now, the only trouble is I didn't get this one lined up right, so it won't go in. Uh, it's a nice tight fit I might have with that solder I put on there, as you can probably guess. Just gonna push this one in there. I have to get both of these now to be in harmony. This has been too far in the opposite direction, as I gotta bend it forward. Bend this one backwards so it'll go in, and hopefully not break the motor contact. Danger with bending these things too much is those motor contacts are your only power link to the motor. If they get if they break off, you're in big trouble. There it is, I got it in. Ha <laughs> ha, finally. <laughs> and actually, look at that. They actually... Ugh, sorry if this was out of focus that I just couldn't do it any other way. If I can get this camera to cooperate. <sighs> My focus on this camera really stinks. This is really annoying. All right, there we go. Ugh. Sorry about that, folks. But as you can see here, I did get those two in. I may have to probably edit most of this footage out, but as you can just make out, those two points now made contact with the actual motor set up there, so it's good to go. So 
So now all I have to do is um, basically just put the other frame, put the other frame together, and it should be good to go. Washers are in place in the bottom. Yes, they are. Let's turn this on its side. I'm gonna put my lights back on again. Hopefully, I don't blind you guys. I'm gonna now grab my other side. Let's actually reduce the lights one notch, two notches, three notches. Actually, the lowest notch possible. Let's go in the lowest notch possible again, and let's hopefully stay in focus here. Uh, okay. I think it's really not a happy camper, is it? This camera. Turn that light off. There we go. That's better. I think I'm just going to use my take my lights off altogether and see if that helps. Does not like the light for some reason. Now I'm going to go ahead and take my other side of the frame right here and just place it on top. Not much to see here anyway. This just goes right on top of it. Oh wait, the shafts aren't in place. Oh, that might help. Note itself, you probably want to make sure you put your shafts back in before you reassemble something. <laughs> just testing you folks. I will be on the test, so you want to make sure you study up. <laughs> Okay, that's in. That's going to spin. And this one's going to go in here, too. I don't know why my camera is in such terrible shape. It was working so well. I need to clean the lens on it. Ugh, here we go. Okay, is that in? Is that in? I think it is, yep. So I got both motors. I got both gears installed. Turn my other light on. I don't know why this focus is so far over the place, but you see there, spinning. I'm gonna, I'm gonna drop out of, I'm gonna drop back one because this is just not cooperating here. I do not know why this. I, my apologies on the focus here, folks. I don't know what's going on with this camera. Just not happy tonight. So anyway, as you can see now, I've got everything in place. I spin the, if I spin the gear over, it's cooperating. All the wheel, the gears are turning. Feels free. Expecting that. Yep, that's in. So now what I'm going to do now is since I have both sides in, I can now take that further ado, my other side of the frame, and put it together, making sure the contacts are on the bottom. The washers are in place. I'm just going to now just shove this together. It's like putting the top part of a sandwich on and literally sandwiches into place. So it clips in. Nice and strong clip. And now you notice the decoder is nice and stiff in there. It's not going anywhere. So that'll make a good positive contact with everything. Now I just need to tighten these screws up. But before that, I'm going to put my trucks back in place. And I just did a light cleaning on both of these. They really didn't see any use. It doesn't look like these ever ran at all. It looks like this thing never worked. And I just kind of got fed up with it and put it to the side and never got back to it. Okay, so now I have this together. Roughly, I'm going to now tighten it together. Need my screwdriver. I'm going to use this one instead because it happens to be sitting here. I think I got that from an SSD install kit. That SSD drive cage uh, or drive cage install kit thing. Both of these drive, put both of these screws in. Turn them in nice and tight. Okay, and I think that does it. Oh, no, it doesn't. Because this doesn't stick in there. It's not in very tightly here, so I'm just going to snap it in. I'm going to press this in firmly and turn the screw in further. I don't know why this is not in far enough. Keeps popping off here. That's, I do not like that. These frames are very difficult. I know that uh, Shane Trains with Shane was having a problem with this. Shane over at Trains and Shane uh, had a Intermountain engine. He had a problem with this, I think it was. That um, shell was... I actually found this out looking at his video carefully. The shell was ever so wider. As a result, the ever so, ever so too wide between here and the gap... And as a result of that, what was happening was the engine was dragging against the actual shell when it ran. And you don't want that because that can create major problems. Okay, I got this all together here. 
So that should do pretty well now. This isn't kind of flopping up, but the part I'm concerned about is in the middle there. I'm just going to let it sit up, sit up like that. I'm going to go ahead now and... No uh, shorts. That's always a good start. Test That's always a good start. We hope you do better than that, but... 15, let's see if this works now at 59.33. So let's see our loco. Always starts on 59.33. Let's see if this will respond. Ah, we got a headlight. And we got another headlight. And let's see if she'll move. Growling it up gently. Yep, there it is. Ha ha ha! Okay, so I brought this thing back to life. Wasn't actually wasn't actually alive to begin with, I don't think, because I think that reason why this never worked is that the decoder itself, as you further zoomed out here, was never properly installed. I don't know how well this video is going to come out because of all the problems I had with the with the camera. Let's go ahead and try this again. Nice and smooth. Gonna run a little rough, I guess, because it hasn't in service ever. It's been sitting around for who knows how long. Okay, so with that, I'm gonna now lift this thing off the track carefully and place the shell back on top and do some final testing with it. Really nice engines, these beat, these, um... oh, I just realized something I didn't put one little detail on, I almost forgot. The cab light protector thing. This prevents the cab from lighting up and it forces the headlight to come through the top. So I think it goes in like that. Couldn't go in like that, could it? No, it has to go in this way. That goes in there. Let's put the fuel tank on the bottom. There we go. There we go. There we go. It's inside its shell. Let's try again. Let's make sure she runs. Make sure we get on the track so I don't have a short. That would be really great if I didn't have a short. Alrighty. There it goes. Yep, working fine. Let's go forward again. I don't see the headlight. There it is. It's working. It's very dim, though. And that's a surprising that that's strong on this model, but it does work. Okay. So I'm going to call that a success. I don't know how good the footage came out. I'll edit it through, and I'll, or I'll put some voiceover to fix it. But the, but the important part is, this engine is done. It's running beautifully now. It's actually functional compared to what it was before. And I'm very satisfied with that. So that's going to do it for this video. If you liked it, give it a thumbs up. If not, thumbs down. Please like and subscribe. And as always, keep the metal side down.